Hello and welcome. I'm Sumit Gupta. I'm a storage engineer at Meta. I'm joined by Riley Thompson, who is my colleague at Pure Storage. And today we're going to talk about flash storage, especially QLC and how at Meta we are using it to balance power, performance, and cost. So data is growing, we all know that, but what is also growing with data are the use cases. And because of that, storage demand is getting harder and harder to predict. At Meta, we have been building flash clusters in exabyte capacity, and we're still running out of capacity. We're still running out of space. And we find that 90% of the data on these clusters is active, which means that we now need to build even bigger clusters. But at the same time, we don't really have power because the power budgets are not growing. In fact, in some cases, they are shrinking. And hence, power is now the new economy, and dollar cost is not the only cost. We have to also think about power. And of course, at the same time, IO demand is not shrinking either. It's actually scaling, and sometimes it is scaling linearly with the size of the data. So let's understand the IO demand a little bit more. So to better understand IO demand, we define a metric called data temperature, which is a ratio of bandwidth to bytes. Basically, how much bandwidth a service provides or a service consumes, and how much capacity a service provides or a service consumes. So we have most of our data today is on HDDs. And HDDs are actually getting denser, but they are not providing more throughput. As you can see, the graph on the right-hand side, it's showing that the data temperature is dropping. So when we used to have 10 terabyte HDDs, we were getting about 15 megabyte per second per terabyte. But as we are going towards 30 terabyte HDDs, we are now only getting about 5 megabyte per second per terabyte. But we do need to build larger clusters, and these larger clusters demand very high bandwidth. So how do we provide more bandwidth? So the alternate is to use TLC SSDs for hotter data. But TLC SSDs, they cost a lot, and at the same time, they consume much more power. So the two cost dynamics that we talked about, they are actually much worse with TLC SSDs. So how do we solve this? So this is where QLC Flash enters the scene. QLC Flash actually forms a very nice middle tier between HDD and TLC. In terms of capacity, QLC is actually the densest media. And that density actually does come with some problems, which we will talk about in the next slide. In terms of cost, QLC is actually, again, in the middle of HDD and TLC. And in terms of performance, QLC performs much better than HDDs, which is better because now we can move hotter workloads from HDD uh, to QLC. But in terms of power, this is where QLC shines the most. It has the lowest watt per terabyte as compared to both HDD and TLC SSDs. So this, this greatness does come with some challenges. So the biggest challenge is the density. In order to get the power savings, we need to build servers which are much denser than our TLC servers today. We need to put almost petabytes of storage in, a, in every server. And then we need to deliver about 20 gigabytes per second for every one of those petabytes. So how do we deliver such high bandwidths? So today, the way we are starting with this is we are looking at dual socket servers where each socket is a service instance. So we run our, our software service uh, and instance per socket, and then each socket gets its own network card. This actually allows us to avoid the cost of the UPI bus, and at the same time actually allows us to amortize the cost of shared services which are not in the data path across the two sockets. But that's just the beginning. There are actually further considerations and more things that we are discovering as we move forward. One of the things with QLC is that it does not provide enough write bandwidth. So we need to actually think about reducing write amplification and any other means of reducing writes that are going to the media. So we are doing this by, by doing a fragmentation of air allocation. So we are putting data in locations which are the least fragmented. At the same time, we have fixed buffers for garbage collection so we allow user rights to a burst into those fixed buffers. The side effect of that is that garbage collection can lag behind. But we solve that by using dynamic write rate to throttle the user rights in case GC, GC does get behind. At the same time, we have some small rights, which are actually non-consequential on TLC media. But here we are actually removing those small rights to go into QLC, such as deletion records. And lastly, you know, read and write rates on QLC are different. So we are actually rate limiting them separately so that reads do not get serialized behind writes. But all of this assumes that the underlying media can perform and is reliable, which is easier said than done. And now how are partners at Pure Storage thinking about performance and reliability? Over to Riley. Thanks, Sumit. 
Hi, my name is Riley. I'm a software engineer at Peer Storage, where I've been working on Flash technology for almost 10 years now. As you can see, I clearly like hardware. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the gory details that make QLC work under the hood. The file system assumes that QLC is performant and reliable, but it actually takes quite a bit of doing to make that a reality. All right, I want to focus on three core challenges of working with QLC today. One, QLC has lower endurance than other types of flash. Two, QLC has higher error rates than other types of flash. And three, QLC is just so large and so dense that the amount of memory required to manage it becomes very expensive. So we're going to talk through each one of these in a little more detail, but first I want to take a step back and look at the solution at a high level. So this is a sketch of what we've co-designed with Meta. As you can see, the file system sends IOs to block devices as usual, but in this case, the block devices are actually virtual, and those IOs are redirected to Direct Flash software, which is Peer's user space data path process. Direct Flash software performs flash management and translation, and sends IOs down to the Direct Flash modules, which are Peer's custom SSD hardware. Now, this may look a little complicated at first, but it allows us to do something really powerful which is pull the traditional smarts of SSD firmware up into the direct flash software layer. And since that layer has global visibility into all the flash in the system, that allows us to maximize the context and therefore the efficiency of the flash management. This also allows us to iterate very quickly in the data path in software, which has been really useful so far because we definitely don't get all these little details right the first time. Finally, this allows the DFMs themselves to be very simple, which makes them denser and more reliable than other types of SSDs. In fact, we can scale a single DFM up to about 600 terabytes with current flash technology. All right, let's get back to our challenges. So that first challenge was endurance. Endurance is a measure of how many times you can write a little piece of media before it wears out and becomes unusable. So to see how that interacts with flash, Let's do a quick review. So flash is made up of erase blocks. Erase blocks must be written sequentially and erased altogether. And you can only do that so many times before they sort of wear out. And for QLC, the number of times is much lower than other types of flash. On the other hand, applications want a write anywhere interface and they don't wanna to have to think about any of this. So this necessitates a translation layer and a garbage collector. The garbage collector, when it's you know, going around and looking for garbage, often finds live data that it has to move somewhere else first. This results in a phenomenon called write amplification, leading to reduced effective endurance of the media. And since we know that QLC already has pretty low endurance, we're gonna need low write amplification for this all to work well. So how do we achieve low write amplification? Well, it turns out that if you pack data with similar lifetimes into the same flash blocks, GC ends up encountering less live data. So what we did here is exposed many virtual volumes to the file system, each tied to physical flash blocks. This allows us to capture lifetime correlations that are present in the file system's individual data streams, leading to better write amplification, improved endurance, and tackling our first challenge. Let's move on to the second challenge, uh, which was the increased error rate of QLC. So this problem is not unique to QLC. All flash is imperfect and has read errors. And SSDs minimize this by writing with parity across flash blocks in a drive. This protects against failures at the sector, the block, and even the die level. But at scale, there are more layers in the picture. So there's dozens of SSDs in a storage node, and the distributed file system must already, already be tolerant to entire nodes going offline. So what happens when an SSD fails? Well, we have to rebuild it at the cluster level, which places a significant load on the network and impacts performance and uh, reliability. In the direct flash architecture, we also need local parity to, again, deal with that elevated error rate of QLC. But global flash management allows us to distribute that parity across the DFMs. This means that if a single DFM fails, we can rebuild it entirely local inside the node without any extra load on the network uh, which improves reliability and performance at the cluster level and solves our second challenge. Our third and final challenge was memory. Um, as we described earlier, flash translation requires this translation table 
uh, in order to expose a write anywhere interface. And the granularity of this table is known as an indirection unit or an IU. The challenge here comes when trying to scale up. So again, QLC is just so dense and so large that if you stick with a standard four kilobyte IU, a petabyte of flash, which we can easily fit in a node now with QLC, takes a terabyte of memory to manage, which is very expensive. So for this reason, large new SSDs are increasing the IU size to 16 or even 64 kilobytes but there's a downside to this. If writes are not aligned to the IU size, a read modify write must be performed, which impacts performance and endurance. So how do we deal with this situation? Well, in this case, we're serving an append-only file system. And so while writes may not be nicely aligned, they're generally written in large sequential streams. So we can delay and coalesce the writes in these streams and form full IUs, entirely avoiding read modify write. This has allowed us to push the IU size all the way up to 512 kilobytes, reducing that memory requirement down to only eight gigs per petabyte of flash, which is pretty reasonable and solves our third challenge. So to recap, we talked about these three challenges of working with QLC and the ways that the direct flash architecture addresses those challenges uh, in order to make QLC a performant and reliable option at scale. So now I'm gonna hand it back over to Submit to wrap up. Thanks, Riley. So at Meta, we are really excited about QLC. We are collaborating with our partners and we are promoting the ecosystem alignment. At the same time, with continued investments in QLC and cost improvements, we are hoping that the number of use cases that are landing on the media will increase and QLC will become a more attractive media for a broader range of data center workloads. Thank you.